there's this radical truth that we are so quick to dismiss. The fact that God loves that us. Again? Apparently. <laughs> It's something you've probably heard a million times, and to most, it's more of a pleasantry than exclamation. Like, we believe that God loves us in the same way that we believe God is going to bless everyone that sneezes. But this polite saying shouldn't be taken so lightly because, for some reason, a perfect God has chosen to love such filthy and disgusting people as us. and they're so happy together and they're doing all of these sweet things for each other and you look at that and go, that's it. That's what love is. But our relationship with God is not like that. It's not this attractive romance. Actually, we're terrible to God. We curse Him, mock Him, abandon Him, hate Him, and for some reason, He still loves us. Despite our sin, despite the fact that we don't love him back, despite the fact that we are just a bunch of wretched creatures, he still loves us. And no one would choose the role of God in this love story because God's love isn't this glamorous display of emotion, but it's actually this desperation to be in a relationship with his creation. And God displayed his eternal love for us in that he came to earth and suffered the consequences of our mistakes. And he died this horrific death for us, just so we could maybe one day love him back. His death wasn't a mutual exchange of affection. It was a one-sided display of sacrificial love. We were still sinners. We still hated him. We still cursed his name. And he chose death for us. Why? Because he loved us. We didn't earn it. We definitely didn't deserve it. But a parent doesn't love their child based on what the child has done. They love it because it's their child. And we are God's chosen children who he loves. Not because we deserve it, but because that's just who he is.
Savior still loves us. Have a record of your visit. 
we would appreciate that so much and let us know if there's anything that we can do to help you. If you would like a visit from Brother Tony or any uh, prayer requests that you might have or anything like that. And uh, we would love to be a help and a blessing to you as you have been a blessing to us by being here this morning. If you are able to, I'm going to ask you to stand for our Bible reading this morning. And as you turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we will dismiss Children's Church. It looks like some of them already dismissed themselves. I think they predicted what was going to happen next. And they're off. Funny how they're quicker than the adults. Huh? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the first three verses for our Bible reading this morning. And the Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that we have it in our possession, and may we uh, never take that for granted. Thank you for that. We have a place that we can come under freedom, without fear of persecution, that we can assemble together with other believers and fellowship and sing praises to you and hear the, the word of God preached in love and in truth. We ask that the Holy Spirit might go from person to person this morning and speak to our hearts and decisions will be made that we would be drawn closer to you this morning. We thank you for what you will accomplish in hearts all throughout this building this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Before my God. 
because I didn't want to waste my voice, and then I enjoyed singing so much, I did it anyway. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so God, we said last week, uh, because God is love in the Trinity, that God was experiencing and expressing love in Himself before we were ever created. And then that God gave us, in, in creating us, the opportunity to express love in Him. And this agape love, which is different, which for you and I, allows us to, to experience love as it was intended. And so God has a plan, and that love should be an example for other people. Now, <clears throat> I'm sorry, you're just going to have to kind of put up with that today. Um, so there's this idea of, of, uh, of this different kind of love, which God intends us to experience, G.K. Chesterton said this, free love, the idea of free love, this love that doesn't have any boundaries, you can just do with it whatever you want to do with it, is a black and white contradiction in two words. Love was never intended to be free. That it is in, that it is in its nature intended to bind itself. That love was never intended for you to just use it as a feeling and to do whatever you want to do with it. That love in its nature, the way God intended it to be, it restricts and binds itself. That when God created love, this agape love, that it restricts, it is restrictive in its nature. Or uh, another way to look at it, uh, C.S. Lewis said this, that, that in the Greek, for us, we have one word for love. And we use it for everything. Okay, um, if you love Italian food, that's what they had at the Valentine's banquet. <clears throat> you may love Italian food. You may love your dog Snickers. And you may love uh, that new dress that you bought. And you might love your husband. Like, that's weird that you would use the same word for all of those. Um, but in the Greek, they had different words for love. They had agape, which is the love of God, this true sense of what love is. They had Stargate, this personal love, for, or parental love for a child. They had Phileo, this brotherly love. They had Eros, this romantic love. But, uh, but uh, C.S. Lewis said the last three kinds of love do not have, uh, do, don't make sense. They don't have a, a point of reference without agape love. In other words, if you don't have the agape love of God, then the other three kinds of love, which you experience and you feel, don't have a point of reference. They don't make sense. So you can't experience them correctly if you don't have the agape love. Or, Rabbi Zacharias said it like this, love cannot be defined apart from God. You can't do it. Which is why the Bible says, he that doesn't know God does not love. Now, doesn't mean that he cannot feel. Doesn't mean that he doesn't have emotions. And that he doesn't like you. It just means he doesn't love in the true sense of what God created love to be. And we're going to show you how that's the case here this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because for us, we need to be able to measure. For us, we need to be able to say, well, um, am I doing it right or not? Which is why I believe 1 Corinthians chapter 13 was written. It kind of gives us a litmus, a litmus test for what love is. Which is and today we're going to do the... Well, Scott, this is not the right one. So, I get like, that. <coughs> so, you don't mind checking that. It is on the, uh, you know, the, uh, on the, what do you call that? The cloud? <laughs> it's on there, somewhere in the cloud. But this morning, we're going to take, whether or not it's on the, uh, uh, on the PowerPoint or not, we're going to take the Is It Really Love test. So, if, um, if you're taking notes or if maybe it's on the uh, U version, if you're on U version, and we're going to do that from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Also, we're going to do it from Luke chapter number 10. 
Um, so 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 and Luke chapter number 10. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so also, Rami Zachariah, um, apologist, he also wrote this, uh, uh, stated that uh, there are three basic kinds of societies you can be a part of. And as he was talking about love, he said there's this um, um, theonomous aside society where people say, okay, we have a general rule that God um, has given us a, a general rule which we all agree in, uh, agree with, that God has a law, theonomous, or uh, uh, theos, God, uh, um, and, and, and this uh, animus, or uh, this, this law, God law, which, by the way, you need to see in the Constitution, this, this God and nature, the, the law of God and nature's God, uh, people just used to understand, there was a general understanding that God, there was this general sense that God had a plan for man. And we all just kind of live underneath that plan. You can either um, accept that that is the culture, that we all accept that God has a plan. If you don't like that, then there's the heteronymous culture, which means um, out another law, or the people at the top get to make the law and tell you what the law is. You see that in a lot of the Islamic cultures. Um, where they'll tell you how to wash and how to pray and when to pray and what to do and how to do it. And, and so you would say, well, I don't like that one. The other one is an autonomous, which means man's law. Every person gets to make their own law, self-law. You say, yeah, that's the one I like better. Well, the problem with that is that only works until we disagree. So, for example, if you say, well, I think love, like I, someone told me, says, but Tony, yes. That's the same one. Okay. Well, that's the one. <laughs> I just didn't change the title. All right. I've been sick. You'll have Set to Set us up for failure. So, it is a really love test. All right. So, the concept is that, that this autonomous <laughs> culture only works if we never disagree. I get to make the rules, and I get to make the rules about love. And the guy told me, he said, well, well uh, uh, sex doesn't have a gender. I'm like, that's true, but you and I do. So today you even have people identifying, you have people identifying as non-human. Well, that's fine until we disagree. And so if I disagree with you, then all of a sudden, we're no longer an autonomous culture. You want to go back to a heteronomous culture where you get to tell me I'm wrong. And then if I see you go into the ladies' bathroom, I see a guy going to the ladies' bathroom behind my wife, then I'm going to revert to a heteronomous culture where I'm going to tell you, you're wrong. Because then there's going to be two guys in there. Okay, we all going to be explaining what's going on in the, in the women's bathroom. Okay, we may have a meeting in there. So it only works until there's a disagreement we break down. It only works when you understand that God has a plan for it. That God has a plan for love. And when everybody decides they're going to be autonomous in their ideas about what love is and the sanctity of love, then love breaks down. So how can I tell in my life if I'm really experiencing and by the way, love is something that God gives me at salvation, that in the Holy Spirit I have it, and I have to exercise it, not feel it. It's not this proof proof stuff that I'm going to be always excited to do. That's the problem with love. That nothing wrong with the eros kind of love. I don't mind Valentine's Day. I like doing stuff. With the lovely and talented Rachel Pierce. I like the phileo kind of love. Right? I love brotherly love. I love hanging out with other people. I enjoy that feeling of companionship. I love stars. I love my children and taking care of my children 
and I love spending time with my children. But those are things, and by the way, even those only make sense underneath God's authority of love, the principles of love that say this is what is necessary if you feel it or not. And here's how it makes sense. First of all, well, Scott, you playing back there? Mm -hmm. Okay, don't do that. Number just, one. Just stand by. <laughs> number one. Um, first Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number one. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and listen to this. If you write in your Bible, underline these words. And have not. I have not. Not feel. I don't have love. I'm becoming sound and brass. I'm becoming sound and brass and tinkling symbol. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can move mountains, and there it is, have not. I don't have this. Um, though I bestow my, uh, my good to be the poor, and I give my body to be burned, and here it goes again, I have not. I don't have this. Then, um, then it goes on to say, then it profits me nothing. <laughs> so it goes on verse number four. Love suffers long and is kind. Number one, is the love that you're expressing, is the love that you're experiencing, is this love still love when others have little or nothing to offer? You know what the Bible says? That love, the right kind of love, casts out fear. In the love that you're experiencing, in the love that others experience from you, are they, are they scared that when you can't provide them what you've been providing them, that you'll be gone? Are, you're scared, are you scared that they'll be gone? If you're looking at my wife and I were reading a devotion the other day about a man who was in the military and um, a phosphorus grenade went off in his hand and, and it, he, his face was uh, horribly disfigured. And he was just newly married. And he, he, he gave the story, recounted the story of how he felt when he first saw what he looked like in the mirror. And he was horrified. Not because of what he looked like, but because of what his new wife might say. And he had seen other wives there leave their husbands because of different things that had happened to them um, in the military. And do you remember what she called him when they saw each other? Anyway, so he gets off this plane and she's there to meet him and she runs and she kisses him right there on the, on the spot that, it, that this grenade had gone off and she called him by a pet name that she only called him in the most intimate of moments. And he said, I can't explain to you what that did to me. When I could tell that she didn't love me because of how I looked. That, but that even though this was my new condition, that the love was still there. The question is, is your love still love when the other person has little or nothing to offer? Listen again what the Bible says, verse number four. That love suffers long. That is to say, it puts up with that person at their worst. And that it is kind. That it is kind. The word, that the idea that it is kind gives you the idea that it's kind when it should probably need to be kind. Like it's kind anyway, is the thought. Now with that being said, I want you, if you would, to look at Luke chapter number 10 and verse number 25. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? What do you read in the law? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he, that is Jesus, said, answered and, and uh, said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, 
said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, what was the question? What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, what if you're red? He said, love the Lord your God. Now, again, when we think of loving the Lord, we ordinarily think of this feeling. But I'm telling you today what real love looks like. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, which we'll expound more on next week. And the guy willing to justify himself said, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus said, I'll, let, let me explain to you who your neighbor is. And Jesus answering him said, a certain man went down to Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. So you want to know who your neighbor is? There was a guy who went out of Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, and he fell among thieves. They beat him, they took all his stuff, and they left him in the ditch, half dead. There's who your neighbor is. Who's the guy ought to be loving? He's the guy in the ditch that can't love you back. He doesn't have the ability. He's got nothing. Fact of the matter is, if you're going to love this guy, you're going to love him at cost to you. What does love look like? It looks like loving somebody who might not be able to repay that love. For us, we use terms like, well, we just fell out of love, or we grew apart. Yeah, well, godly love is not love that is dependent on the return of love. If that's the kind of love you're calling love, you're not calling love the right kind of love. If you wake up tomorrow and your spouse has changed something in their life, and you fell out of love, then that was never the right kind of love. That's hard. What does God's love look like? It looks like the man in the ditch. He lost everything. He's half dead. He said, who's my neighbor? Who's this guy I'm supposed to love? What does this love look like? She said, I am so, so glad you asked. He looks like the person who can't love you back. The Bible says, what profit is it if you love somebody who loves you? He said, don't even the, 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 the people who don't know God do that? Everybody loves people who love them. Everybody loves people who can do stuff for them. Don't even the heretics and the hypocrites do that? Real love is that love that when you... Somebody was giving me a testimony this morning of, of a family situation in their lives where they had just about lost everything. Then what? The guy that who's buried out front in the prayer garden, not cemetery, <laughs> <coughs> ended up being very successful in the trucking business. He told me one time, he said, the best time of our life is when we struggled the most. He said, we didn't have anything except for each other. And the love that we have for each other. You know what love looks like? Love looks like loving somebody that can't love you back. Or if they didn't have anything, or if they didn't have the means, you would still love them anyway. Is it really love test? Is this love that you claim to have for somebody still love when they can do little or nothing for you? Number two, does this love put others first? The Bible says in verse number four, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. We went where you wanted to eat last time. How many of the petty arguments that we have are over? Who got to do what, when, and why? It doesn't envy. It doesn't vaunt itself up. It is not puffed up. This love that God is talking about doesn't put itself first. It's not, what, it's not what godly love does. When Jesus' disciples were arguing about who was greatest in the kingdom, Jesus said, 
Even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. The example of Jesus' love to us was a love of service and not being served. Jesus said the greatest among you is the person who's learned to love out of service. In our example, Luke chapter number 10, verse number 31 and by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at that place, he looked on him and he passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. He came where he was. He put him first. As he journeyed, he had somewhere to be. He had somewhere to go. But what he did is he put this man in the ditch first. You know he had to think to himself, what's this in the ditch? That's somebody. Who's this in the ditch? How this man get in the ditch? If I stop, I'll be late on my trip. I wonder if he's even alive. He's already half dead. No doubt this process is going. He probably did something to put his own self in the ditch. <clears throat> right? We do it ourselves. For us, he goes something like this. He could do better if he wanted to. But he, as he journeyed, went to the place where he was. He put him first. It's what love looks like. No one, I doubt, this morning got up thinking, you know what? I think I'm going to put people first this morning. That sounds fun. I just feel loving today. It's not how it goes. It's a choice that has to be mirrored. It has to be applied and it has to be practiced. But I bet you this morning, at least somebody thought, I wish... Somebody would put me first for once. I bet you somebody wished they would be loved today. What Jesus does, he says, listen, I'll show you what love is. Love is when you go, some, you go your way and you put someone first. Number three, the third question, does this love cross any of God's prescribed lines? Verse number five says, love does not behave itself unseemly. You want to know one way for sure you know it's not love? If it crosses any of God's boundaries. If there's anything that God says, don't do that, then that's not love. That's something else. That's lust. You know that God says, don't do that. But Brother Tony, it's love. No, 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 no. You might really, really like it, but it ain't love. Why? Because love, what love does not do, love does not do, it does not behave itself in a way that is inappropriate toward the maker of love. You see, one of the things is about love is that God has made it sacred for us. He's made everything that exists in this life, say, you ever heard anybody say, well, um, 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 I don't do that which is, is, is sacred, uh, I do that which is secular. <clears throat> like the opposite of sacred is not secular. The opposite of sacred is sinful. We have this idea that there's God stuff and then there's world stuff. And I can do stuff because we're in the world but not of the world. And I can do world stuff. No, you can function in the world as a believer. But if what you're doing in the world as a believer is outside of what God has designed, it's sinful. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Number four. Number four. Is this love reflected in your attitude? If I have to say, all right, Rachel, God said I love you, so I'm loving you. Uh, nope. 
That can't be how it is. So, notice here what the Bible says. It does not make itself unseemly. It seeks not her own. It is not easily provoked. It doesn't seek her own. It has this attitude of, of not being all about itself and it not easily provoked. Every time something goes the wrong way, it doesn't fly off the handle and, and go nuts about it. It's not easily provoked. Look at what happens in uh, Luke chapter number 10, verse number 33. Listen how this Samaritan is, is, uh, is described. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. You see, this person had compassion. The attitude by which he did what he did was as important as what he did. I'm doing what I do because there's a reason why I do what I do. Because of what God has done for me, the Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. Remember what we said last week, how God loves the Son and the Holy Spirit and they love one another and they are building one another and how then they loved us and we love Him and then we love other people and we've been invited as believers to this big love fest. And this is why in 1 John the Bible says His commandments are not grievous to us. We're not stomping around like I guess I better go to the people today. No, this Samaritan, he's not upset about it. You never read this story of the love of a neighbor. This Samaritan, you never read him upset. Loving this person. And one of the things you'll find out the more you love people on purpose, the easier it gets to love people on purpose. People who really love people, don't post on Facebook. Tired of being mistreated. Right? I'm always going out of my way for people and I'm always getting mistreated. I bet you that ain't true. I bet it ain't true. That's not how it happens. The more you love people in sincerity with the right attitude, for the right purpose, the easier it is to love people. Why? Because you know what God did for you. You know what real love is. Number five, is it pure? Is this love pure? I heard a guy this one time, I forget exactly who it was, but he'd asked a friend, have you ever loved anybody, anybody, just for their sake? You may immediately think, yeah, my children... Uh, you didn't get anything out of that? That's not true. Right? We as parents, we're proud of them kids. I don't care if they they eat their SpaghettiOs with their spoon upside down. We think they just, you know, spelled Czechoslovakia. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? They just said their first word. Like, that was not a word. Yes, it was. I can tell. I mean, okay. I'm not going to argue with you. You didn't get anything out of it. I'm asking you, have you ever loved somebody just for their sake? What love is, what real love is, is pure. It's pure. Listen to what the Bible says in verse number 5. Doth not behave itself unseemingly, it does not seek her own, it's not easily provoked, it thinks no evil. There's no undertow, there's no, there's nothing there for itself. It's not like it has a hidden agenda. It thinks no evil. You know what the Samaritan did who went and found this guy in this ditch? Luke chapter number 10, verse number 34. The Bible says that he took this guy, he went to him, he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. You know what he did? He purified this guy's wounds. He made sure there wouldn't be any, any infection. He made sure that there was purity there. How does your love handle the truth? How does your love handle the truth? This is a difficult 
Can you be honest in your relationship? In your relationships? <clears throat> Can you be honest with yourself? Can you be honest with your partner? Uh, oftentimes people will come to me and say, but Tony, our biggest problem, ordinarily she'll say, is communication. Which ordinarily means he doesn't talk enough. Which ordinarily means he probably talks too much. Because I ordinarily say, communication is not the abundance of words. Doesn't mean you talk a lot. It means you're able to say clearly what needs to be said. <coughs> Doesn't mean you just ramble on about tomato paste, where you were, what you did at the grocery store. It means can you say what needs to be said about what's going on in your deepest thoughts and in your deepest heart? Can you deal with the truth about what's going on in your world and your life? What if somebody came and said, look, what if three, or three out of four of your friends came and said, as you were dating, hey man, she ain't good for you. What would you have said? Oh, you don't know it like I do. Uh, sound like, man, you can't handle the truth. Why are you ignoring what everybody else is saying? There's some truth there you seem like you just kind of intentionally not paying attention to. Or how about just the truth of God's word? Hey, what you're doing in this relationship is outside of God's truth. <coughs> yeah, but yeah, but what? How does love? Here's the thing about real love. Real love addresses the truth. In Luke chapter number ten and verse number thirty-five, he carries this man who was in a ditch to an innkeeper. And listen to what the Bible says. And on the morrow he departed and took two pence and gave it to the host. And he said unto him, take care of him. You know what he was telling him? Identify what the problem is. Whatever the problem is, identify it and handle it. It's amazing how difficult it is for me, Tony Pierce, to identify the truths in my life. But you know, you know why? Because I'm scared what my wife or what those who are closest to me might really think of me if they knew the truth. But perfect love casts out fear. And here's why. Because we don't love like God says love. Just this morning, a pastor called and asked me to pray for him. He said he's been in preached. <laughs> Asked to leave his church. I thought that was hilarious. I mean, I didn't know him. I'm like, don't call me and act serious and then use the word and preach. I ain't got that in me. I said, I didn't expect, at least I didn't expect it to go down like that. I didn't expect the people who told me they loved me for 10 years to act like that. What happened to... What happened to the love? What happened to just doing things the way God said? No, we're scared to death for the truth of our life to be what it is. And therefore, Psalm 63, we walk in vain show so nobody knows the truth. Because if we knew the truth, we wouldn't act appropriately. Because why? We don't love correctly. Because we don't go back to number one and love people when they're not what we thought they were. Would you still love me if I downloaded this message off the internet today? Now I, just, I mean, I've been sick this week. I'm just busy. I just downloaded this thing. Offline. I didn't. Because it got real weird. <laughs> but it is real weird that it got real weird. And it's okay to say, hey, but it's only man, you know, we kind of pay you to get into God's Word and read and study. But do you see how it goes? See how it goes that we're so scared just to be open and vulnerable. Would you still love me if I said, hey man, look, Rachel and I are having some real problems in our marriage. <laughs> Gas. 
share it with other people. You know what love does? It looks truth right in the face and just says this is what it is. Do you still love me if I had some immorality come up? I understand if you said, hey, you know, you really can't be the leader of New York Baptist Church. I'm asking would you still love me? But I still feel love here. Because that's what the Bible's called us to do, is to love one another. The Bible says this, by this shall all men know you're my disciples, if you love one another. How does your love handle the truth? About yourself, the truth about other people. Seven. Just this one and one more. Where does your love place the responsibility? In other words, when things go wrong, whose fault was it? In other words, who has the responsibility for love in your relationship? You know what the first step of seven, according to psychologists, to divorce is? First step, I've said this before. First step is surprise. Surprise! I didn't know it was going to be like that. Listen to what the Bible says here. The Bible says uh, in verse number 7 of 1 Corinthians 13, love bears all things. What if, what if you were sitting there and I said, here, hold this, and hold this, and hold this. Hold this and hold this, and eventually you'll be like, I'm not sure if I can bear it. The Bible says, Love bears all things, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love, here you go, endures all things. It endures all things. This is what love does. If it has ever failed, it was never love. That's hard, man. If it has ever failed, this is what the Bible says. First of all, Luke chapter 2, verse number 35. On the morrow he departed and took two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. I'm giving you money. Take care of it. I'm taking on the responsibility. Lastly, what is the expectancy, the life expectancy of this love? What does it say? Love never fails. Does not fail. Again, if it's ever failed, it's not ever been love. There have never been two people I understand it's difficult. I've never been two people living in the love of God, thriving in the love of God, the love of each other. That's never happened in the history of mankind. If in the history of this country, we would have been living in the love of God, the God pay love of God, we wouldn't have fought a civil war. Because we were living outside of the God made love of God, that people live that kind of nonsense. Trying to own other people. It's because people live outside of the God made love of God that people do to one another what they do today. <coughs> love does not fail. It's not how it works. And I know it's difficult. I want you to listen to what this man did more close. And on the morrow, when he departed, he gave him two pence and told him, he said, take care of him. And whatsoever you spend more, when I come again, I will pay you. He said, I'm not going to stop just here. He said, if you end up spending more, I'll give you more. All this in response to, who's my neighbor that I should love? And Jesus said, this is what it looks like right here. <laughs> This guy was like, oh, yeah, oh my. A little more than I thought it was going to be. Listen, I know it's not easy. I know it's difficult. But this love, again, is not this, this failed love. It's not something that you 
just kind of run into it. Oh, it just feels so good. This is the kind of love that thank God God had for us. That while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. I didn't deserve God's love. I didn't deserve God's love. That's why when we as Christians look at somebody and they're in a bad situation, we we'll look down on them. Whatever situation somebody's in. We don't say that's a horrible person. I don't care what it is. Addiction. Relationship situation. We say, listen, God has an answer for that. We love that person. Even if it is the farthest position that anybody can have from the position that I hold, which is God is right about everything. And my position for them is still, listen, I love you. I love you. You're free to take whatever position you want. The problem is you're not free to choose the outcome of that position. You can read it even in Genesis. The Bible says you turn from God and sin waits at the door. And there God is going to respond to that. At the same time, friend, love is the rule for the believer. It's the rule. Never makes wrong right or right wrong. And I would bet you today that while it sound, sounds very difficult for us, I bet you today everybody would love to experience it in our own life. I bet you'd love to have somebody who loved you like that. I bet you'd love to have a spouse who loved you and you felt safe no matter what you did, no matter if you were dead broke tomorrow, they woke up just loved you like crazy. Bet you'd love it. Bet you'd love to have somebody love you in such a way that you couldn't even understand it. Bet you'd love to have somebody in your life who loved you in such a way that made you scratch your head and say, why do you love me like that? Because it just didn't. God said that's exactly what people should see in the Christian. Love's patient. It's kind of, love doesn't put so first. And it has to be something that we experience and that we practice in our life. Because you're never going to wake up wanting to feel that way. You know what I think I'll let somebody misuse me today? I think I'll just love my enemy today. Hey, my neighbor dog got in my trash. I think I'll buy him a new collar. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? Instead, what we do? Then we'll take the trash our neighbor's dog and got out and we'll chunk it over the fence in our neighbor's yard. But now teach him. Yes, sir, you did teach him. You did teach him. Taught him just what the love of God is not. When your kid acts in a way that's not appropriate, You act inappropriately. And you punish out of anger. You talk. You'd never sit your kids down in the living room and say, hey, listen, when you get married one day, make sure if your wife gets on your nerves, you scream at her. You intimidate her. Make her feel less of a person. You'd never say that out loud. But you teach that form of love every time you do it in front of the kids. No, it's hard not to do that. The Bible says love is patient. It's kind. It puts the other person first. Love well, what Chip Ingram said about love. He said Chip Ingram, love is giving somebody what they deserve the least when they need it the most. It's exactly what God did with us. I'm just asking you, look at your life and see. Am I really living in love or am I just living in like? When I get done with like, then I'm out of love. Which is why the majority of the people we know are in schizophrenic lives and relationships. 
I don't know if I'm going to walk into my house and be loved, or liked, or not liked. <coughs> but I'll right, do it, but nobody else will do it. That's okay. How do you know nobody else will do it? Maybe God's great. Maybe God's great. <coughs> so we stand together. Lord God, we thank you for loving us when we were unlovable. We thank you for loving us when we didn't respond in love. Lord, I freely admit that I've not loved the way that I should love in every situation. Lord, I admit that I've not loved the way I should love in most situations. I'm sorry. There are probably people in this room that I owe apologies to because of that very thing. I just pray that you would forgive me, Lord, for spurning your love. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Help me to love others. In your precious Son, Jesus Christ.